Yeah, welcome everybody. We're glad that you were able to sign on. Um, this is Open Sponsorship's first webinar. We're very excited to talk about some things for athletes. Um, and just so you guys all know, the Q&A option is where you can put questions throughout the entire webinar. Um, we might answer a few throughout and then all the others we can try to answer as many as we can at the end. Um, so you can go ahead and enter any of your questions there and we'll um, get started. I'm gonna introduce our panelists. Um, Rob, if you can go to the next slide. First, we have um, Ishveen. She is our CEO and founder of Open Sponsorship, as many of you guys may know. Um, just some of her many accomplishments was that she was named one of Forbes 30 under 30 and one of Inc's top 100 female founders. So we're very glad that she's able and, to talk to you guys today. And our next speaker is Rob DeGC, and he is currently a professor of sports management at the Wharton School. Um, and he's also the president of Iron Horse Marketing, and that firm launches and grows new ventures, um, does some partnership marketing and different strategic development for um, various brands. Some of his college background, he graduated from Boston College with a BS in class of 87, and then he got his MBA from Wharton in 93. So he's living in New Jersey, um, got two teenage boys, and we're very glad that he's able to share some of his expertise today. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to them to get started. And um, yeah, very excited to get it started. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ashton. I'm going to get started in speaking about marketing and branding in general, and then I will later on pass it on to Ishveen speaking a little more specifically about social media and how you can maximize the opportunities through the open sponsorship platform. So we're here to talk about branding today and what a common question that is often asked of new graduates in marketing interviews is what is marketing? A very simple question, but a lot of people don't have a good answer, but there's a lot of different answers. So what I am posing here is my answer to that question. Marketing is a collection of initiatives to communicate a value proposition to a targeted audience. I didn't use the word good. I didn't use the word strategic, but this is what marketing is in general. And throughout the rest of the webinar today, we'll talk about strategic marketing a little bit more. We'll talk about marketing that is good. And by good, I mean effective. So let's break down that definition a little bit further. The value proposition, communicating the value proposition. It all starts with being direct and clear. The customer, the person on the other side of that message has to clearly understand what utility the product of the brand as a whole achieve. What is this going to do for me? And like any customer in a strong capitalist society, there's a lot of competitive choices out there. And what does this product do better than any of my other choices? What is my competitive advantage? And of course, is there a fit? Does the brand fit into my world? You know, and it would be a misfit, a place where it didn't exist if you were suddenly marketing a new hip hop streaming platform to men 65 and over. But a classic fit that, that makes all the sense in the world from the 70s, daytime television program really focused on easy, tasty, quick meal solutions for the busy mom. And you saw that reflected in the very popular and successful brands of the 70s, whether they be Hamburger Helper, Shake and Bake, Minute Rice, Bisquick, a real fit for the mom that had a need, had a problem, and they were offering a solution to that problem. And then, of course, an effective communication of effective value proposition is the emotion. How does that brand make you feel? Clearly, you feel differently when you sit in, in a the driver's seat of a Lexus versus sit in the driver's seat of a Kia. You feel differently about yourself. You go into McDonald's in Paris and suddenly for just a moment there, you feel a sense of familiarity, a sense that you're home. So once you get through those first four things in communicating the, the value proposition, it's important to communicate to, to, your, to your audience, okay, now how do I get it? And then what's the value? How can I get it for the best possible deal? Does the value make sense? Doesn't mean it's inexpensive. You know, a, um, a Mercedes or a BMW, you expect to pay a lot for the ultimate driving machine, but it's all about 
a value that makes sense and that is clear. Let's speak a little bit more about the target audience. We hear a lot about demographics, but I'll break that down a little bit more. These are just some common cl classifications of reaching that target audience. With the Ralph Lauren ad, clearly reaching towards the gender, trying to reach out to young women, really changing the positioning a little bit of the Ralph Lauren uh, brand, or at least the historical perception of the Ralph Lauren brand. Age, you see Joe Namath, 77-year-old Hall of Fame football player, speaking to his audience about the Medicare coverage helpline. He's not marketing on, on uh, America's Got Talent. He's not marketing on uh, other youthful programmings on the Disney Channel or whatnot. He's marketing on programs where you're going to reach the person who's interested or his or Medicare coverage, who is hiring Joe Namath, is marketing on uh, TV programs where you're gonna reach that older audience who has a need for some help around Medicare. That wealth category, December to remember, what's clear in this ad is the bow on top of the cars, right? This is a gift. In December, you give gifts. Why not give the gift of a new Lexus? That is clearly not something that a middle wealth class or lower wealth class is thinking of, oh, what am I going to get my sweetheart? Let me get her a car, a luxury car. So you're truly marketing towards a wealthy population segment. The masses, not quite the masses with this Zoom screen for progressive. It's really all adults. Children aren't buying insurance. Home auto and life is something, a decision that you're making as an adult. And so they're reaching a wide variety of people. It's not as targeted as some of these other examples I have here. And then of course, lifestyle. In the lower left, I bring up the example here of a woman working and also taking care of a baby. So the busy mom is part of her lifestyle, how she identifies as herself. And there's no product being marketed here. It's just an image saying, if I am trying to reach the busy mom, I, um, if I have a product that serves a need for the busy mom, this is the type of imagery I would include in my ad. So let's get Dibber into branding. Not just branding as in a fire branding on the back of a cattle. This is how it all started really in the 1800s when a, a cattle on a ranch had the brand of that ranch. The customer knew, well, this cattle, this animal is coming from a certain ranch. It's gonna be a certain level of quality. I can trust the quality of the uh, cattle that's coming from this ranch. It has a brand on it, this fire branded. And when we speak about brands on an everyday basis, here's a collection of the Procter & Gamble brands, the brands that we use every single day. But we're in the, today's webinar, we're gonna go deeper. Brands that extend a little bit more. Sports leagues are brands, teams are brand, retailers are brand, and you, the athlete, is a brand as well. So when we talk much like the definition of marketing, the definition of branding is hard to find. You get a lot of different answers. David Ogilvy, who is uh, widely considered the father of advertising. When I was in business school, I had this book, Still Keep It Handy, of Ogilvy and Mather. David Ogilvy on ad advertising said, brand is quite simply the intangible sum of a product's attributes. Personally, I think that's a little too simple. And Marty Neumeyer brings a little bit different twist to it. It's not just the logo, it's not just an identity, it's not just a product, and I think he'd disagree that it's more than what David Ogilvy says, it's not the intangible sum of the product. It's the person's gut feel about that service. What do you think it's gonna do for me? When I'm making a choice, if there's a brand you're familiar with, you're going to choose that choice because you have a gut feel that that product is gonna deliver. Even though internally, the way that that toothpaste is going to clean your teeth, the way it is going to taste, the cost are all about the same you're gonna take the one that is branded that you trust, that you know. Speaking of trust, that's what Steve Jobs sums up branding as. It is simply trust. And we'll speak about that a little bit more. So all brands must have consistency. When you go into Chick-fil-A, you have that same look and feel. You know you're in a Chick-fil-A. Not just in the look and feel, the menu, the cost, but in the service that's delivered. When the Chick-fil-A employee say, doesn't say you're welcome, they say with pleasure, and you do that in Maine or you do that in California, there is a consistent brand 
message that is being contributed, that is being delivered in every possible way, whether that just be the food, the packaging, but also the service. And it has to appeal to the senses, not just, well, it has to appeal, it has to communicate to the person visually, through scent, through smell, through hearing, or through touch. There's many different ways. It's not just looking at a brand and seeing the label on a package. And ultimately, that emotional response, how it makes you feel about yourself. Harking back to that example I just let, said about sitting in a Lexus or sitting in a Kia. And then ultimately, does this product do what it says it's going to do? Does it deliver on that promise? And when it does that consistently, a brand delivers trust, much like Steve Jobs has said. So let me look at a couple examples here. Clearly this evokes an emotion of a certain brand. You see the bottle, the distinctive bottle that Coke actually trademarked over a hundred years ago. And one of the original uh, founders of Coca-Cola said, I want a blind man to be able to reach into a bucket of ice and know he was grabbing a Coke. And so he had that distinctive bottle. You could put anything else in that bottle, but it would still scream Coke to the person. And then the big red box in the middle doesn't say Coke anywhere on that. Doesn't say soft drink, carbonated beverage or anything, but it clearly says Coke because of the white ribbon through the red background. And even if these things, you can hear that, or you can hear that, right? If I were to just play that for you first, you'd say, well, what brand is that? You probably wouldn't go automatically to say, well, that's seltzer over ice. Is that a beer opening, right? That is Coke, and that is part of their brand because of their history, because of their consistency over the years. I'll give you some other example. What are these? Are they crayons? Sure. Are they Crayola crayons? No. But Crayola has done such a great job of marketing a consistency. The crayons delivered in order with the stripes at the top and the stripes at the bottom. You'll see in the middle there, it doesn't say Crayola like real, like they're the authentic Crayola crayon. And actually the stripes on the top are not the same. The Crayola stripe has a little swirl through the middle of it. But because their branding has been so strong, you're likely to think that that is a Crayola crayon. And Play-Doh, speaking of stimulating the senses, I could blindfold you. You haven't had Play-Doh in your life for 20 years, but I could blindfold you and wave a can of Play-Doh under your nose and instantly you will know what it is. In fact, Play-Doh tried to trademark its scent. They, uh, they didn't allow it, but they don't need to. If you're choosing between some kind of molding clay for a child or not, you're gonna want the real thing. And when the mom opens up the can of Play-Doh, it harkens back to when they were a child. So that scent is as much of, of a can of Play-Doh as the jars and the different colored lids or the way Play-Doh feels in your hand. And this, this is a little trickier one, a harder one, right? This is just the name David. But when I tell you, if it doesn't hit you right away, you'll say, oh, of course. This is David as if he were Nutella. Right? A relatively new brand to the United States, only in the last 10 or 15 years or so, it's a big brand in Europe. But when you word the, when you um, put a word in this font with this color in this order, black first and then red, it may be something you think about every day, but it seems familiar. And through that consistency, you're thinking David here is going to deliver some kind of tasty chocolate spread. And what we have here, if this were my normal Wharton class, I would open it up to the to the audience and they all say, well, that's a box of McDonald's fries. No, it's not. It's a box of French fries in a red box, but those are shoestring fries, which are indicative of the McDonald's product. And they're just a red box. If I put curly fries in there or waffle fries, you would think something's wrong. Or if the box in that shape was green, it really wouldn't give you the message that these are McDonald's fries. So the promise would be confusing. You wouldn't know what to expect. But when the fries are delivered like this, you can be very disappointed if those don't taste like McDonald's fries because you have an expectation of the, what the brand is going to deliver. So let me talk a little bit more about brands. Ultimately, the brand is not about talking to yourself. It's about talking to the customer. The whole point of the brand, when you are delivering value to someone else, it has to benefit them. And it doesn't just happen naturally. 
A brand has to earn its place on the shelf, right? It grow, and speaking of food products, a grocery store will carry it because the consumer demands it. They, again, back to the toothpaste, they just don't want something that cleans people's teeth. It's not just a white label in black block lettering that says toothpaste on it. People will ask for Crest. The local supermarket doesn't carry Crest. Something is wrong with the universe. So over 100 years, Procter & Gamble has earned its place on the shelf of Crest. It doesn't always take 100 years. I'm just using the strongest examples to make a point. And remember, when we start talking about personal branding, which we will in a second, it's not about you. It's not about what you feel for yourself. It's about other people's perception of you. We're not talking about yourself as an athlete and how to win and deliver and to accomplish your goals. We're talking now about you as an athlete can monetize your brand, can take advantage of all those things that you've worked so hard for, how you've earned your place on your shelf. And it has to be done consciously with a focus on earning your place on the shelf and understanding who the customer is. So when we look at various brands, there are plenty of marketing objectives. Every type of marketing strategy is designed to accomplish an objective. These days in the last couple of years with the uh, laws that allow sports gambling to be legal in various states, Election J just, uh, just allowed three more states to allow sports gambling in its state. There are new brands out there, brands that people had never heard of or brands that are now delivering something that is possible that they couldn't deliver before. DraftKings, fantasy sports brand, daily fantasy sports brand, now almost completely focused on uh, mobile betting or perhaps um, setting up a DraftKings location where the state allows. William Hill, a brand that's also been around for over 100 years, started in the UK, has a strong presence throughout Europe, but now has to introduce itself to the, to the US marketplace. So they are looking for brand awareness. Defining your brand image or your unique value proposition. Obvious examples, Nike, BMW, Versace. You don't, it's not just about, yeah, these sneakers are gonna take you places. You don't even have to say that. You don't even have to show the product. It's Nike's message. It's Nike's swoosh that are gonna deliver. Does your marketing, does your advertising, any things in the marketing mix communicate the product, the brand attributes? Michelob Ultra, its brand attributes, it's not just beer, it's low carb beer. They've been able to completely rebrand that brand. It's not just Michelob, a higher end level of Budweiser. It is Michelob Ultra that found a niche in the marketplace to deliver a low carb beer. And it only has, it must have got 2.9 carbs per serving versus a regular light beer has five carbs per serving. It's not that much of a difference, but they've created the perception in the consumer's eyes that this is the low carb alternative and this will deliver for you what you expect. Common marketing objective for any grocery store product not any, most grocery store products. I'm not talking about a $30 filet mignon. I'm talking about the packaged goods on the shelves. They want you to sample it. That the marketing is all designed to try something out. And we have some more examples on that later. A great example of tr getting you to drive traffic to come in the store is a new thing that Panera introduced six months ago, just in the beginning of the pandemic. It's kind of interesting, but their marketing is still very strong on that. Is this monthly coffee subscription for $8.99 all the coffee you can drink. And so you're gonna drive past Dunkin' Donuts, you're gonna drive past Starbucks to make sure you're locked in, you're gonna get the most of your Panera subscription. And while you're there, you're gonna buy a breakfast sandwich or a pastry or whatever it might be. So it is a mechanism to drive traffic. It's no longer what the margin is on our coffee. Yes, you're gonna, we're gonna examine that. Do people have the subscription buy more than those people who don't have the prescription? prescription, subscription, excuse me. And then of course, another common marketing objective that we're seeing all over the place is to download apps, get people, there's low risk, they're free. Here's an opportunity to just download. We're gonna, we're, once we got you on your phone, that's the first objective, then we'll worry about you using the app, okay? Defend your market position. This is a little strange thing and we're gonna, we have an example of this later with a video. It's the best example of, there's a lot of choices out there. I ha I'm the market leader. I want to keep being the market leader. Deep in customer loyalty, any type of frequent flyer program, uh, hotel program, 
Starbucks Stars program, all about making sure you come back time and time again, different than the Panera Coffee subscription. And then of course, with any sports marketing program, there's often a hospitality element in order to nurture that relationship, to entertain your best customers. So it's not just about putting a sign in the outfield or TV spots on the local broadcast. It often comes with premium seating or luxury suite seating. So here's some examples of some very strong brand marketing, so much so that the brand isn't even mentioned anymore. Just do it with the swoosh. Now when you just see just do it, you're getting that same message, a reminder of what Nike is there to deliver for you. Gatorade, is it in you? The familiar orange lightning bolt, but so much so that is it in you uh, repeated time and time again that they don't need the lightning bolt. Sometimes I wonder if they just do that the marketers just do this to test their own success or to tout their own success. Let's talk more about uh, some examples of the value proposition. Clearly, what's the value? Act now, vacation later with signing up for the Mileage Plus Explorer Visa card, right? It's, it's not just uh, the, they already have you hooked on Mileage Plus and flying United, making United be your choice. But now I want you to get this credit card and there's a, a value in it for you right now. Switching on the other side, earn 60 stars, get a free drink. Very simple, that's your value proposition. If you're a customer of Verizon, make sure you sign up for Verizon Up, their loyalty program, and you're going to be able to go and see Justin Timberlake in concert. Turning your bills, very mundane part of life, into thrills, once in a lifetime experiences. Now let's switch to that promise. Everybody knows that. 15 minutes will save you 15% or more. Geico has spent more money in the last 10 years than any marketer by far, although State Farm and Progressive are certainly trying to outspend them in recent years. And they are delivering a very simple uh, value proposition. When you go to Geico, it's for savings purposes. And what's the promise that Walmart gives for you? Is the promise to save money, it's even bigger than that. By going to Walmart, you're gonna live better because you save money. That's their message. You're not going to come to Walmart because it's, there's going to be incredible customer service where you're going to check out quick, where you're going to have everything you could possibly want, where you're going to be able to buy a thousand dollar suit, but you're going to be able to live better with some basic everyday purchases. And then generating trial. This again, trying to make it low risk to the consumer. Sign up for QuickBooks. And for 30 days, it doesn't cost you anything. Free trial, try it free, free 30 day trial. Coca-Cola, orange, vanilla, right? It's not a high item item. It's not a high item or a high risk acquisition. You're not try this thousand dollar suit and it's gonna be custom fit for you. And if you don't like it, well, you're out a thousand bucks. We're certainly not letting you return a thousand dollar suit that you had altered. But a 20 ounce bottle of Coca-Cola, orange, vanilla, is 229 at 711 try it maybe we'll even help you with some coupons and promotions that bring you into a certain retailer and warby parker's whole business was based on the try at home program this isn't something that just came about in the pandemic it came about as they thought that there's a, another way to sell glasses glasses are completely dominated by a couple companies but here we make it easy for you we make it fun for you Try at home program, no risk to you. Takes a little bit of work. You got to return it if you don't like it, but it's kind of fun too. But their marketing is all about generating trial. And then, as I mentioned earlier with B2B marketing, nurture a relationship. Take someone to the masters, entertainment, entertain them at Berkman's, a beautiful building that is only in business one week a year for entertaining your, your best customers. Bring them to that and they will be a friend for life. On an everyday basis, taking them to a Green Bay Packers game in the, in the luxury suite. When I was a kid, I always wanted my father to buy a luxury suite because I thought it was great to have a couch and uh, a buffet in the suite, but that was really B2B marketing. Individuals don't often buy luxury suites. Companies do for hospitality purposes. And here's an event that I, uh, am, I launched, the Diamond Resorts Invitational. You see the luxury suites on the 18th hole. You see the, uh, the pop-up concert venue that we created, the view from the luxury home. I am the opportunity to uh, meet John Smoltz at one of the parties. So this celebrity 
now it's an LPGA event, was then a PGA Tour Champions event. It's an opportunity to create once in a lifetime experiences consistent with this hospitality brand, Diamond Resorts, that I worked for. So let me give you that example of Pico Energy and defending the market position. In a normal classroom situation, I would show this and then ask the students to tell me uh, what this message means to them. But in this case, we'll just have to, uh, you'll just think about it on your own. Let me stop the share and then share again as this comes up. Every year, Pico powers thousands of organizations to make a positive impact in our community, from aiding those in need to educating our youth, providing access to cultural institutions, and creating new opportunities for growth in our region. This holiday season, we invite you to join us in the season of giving by looking for ways to help others. Together, we can make this season even brighter. From everyone at Pico, have a safe and happy holiday season. So several years ago, the, uh, the energy business was deregulated. And so, um, uh, let me see, do we still have, I'm sorry to interrupt here. I don't see the, uh, let me just move this here, here it is. All right, you can see that. One of my uh, teammates, Ishveen or Ashton, can you see the uh, presentation? Yep, but it's okay. a, small, a smaller screen, so you might want to do the present again. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, there it is. So, um, back to that. Several years ago, electricity was deregulated. And so every Pico had 98% of the electricity market in the greater Philadelphia area. But when they deregulated, the government said, well, Pico has the pipes. They will be the one who will still be the person that delivers the electricity. But you have any number of choices who you actually buy the electricity from. Pico didn't want you to switch to anybody else. They want you to know, well, who else would I have? We are well, Pico, we're part of the community. And then at what better time than the holidays to uh, communicate that Pico is your neighbor, just like the people living across the street are your neighbor. And so they spend a lot of money in defending their marketing position. A lot of sponsorships at the local sports teams, a lot of billboards and other signage along the main throughways in, um, in Philadelphia, so that you wouldn't be inclined to switch. You wouldn't even think about it. Who else? I need electricity. Pico is, is who I use. So let's take that broader image of marketing for all these different types of consumer brands and direct it a little bit more towards you, the professional athlete. And we spoke a lot about consistency. And I'm not saying that the, my direction here is to come up with something novel and unique from which to, to suddenly make dramatic changes, but you have a certain consistent image how you dress, how you carry yourself, the amount of energy, all those authentic things that you don't even think about, but they are truly part of your brand. They don't have to be radical or crazy, but they are part of your brand. Also, when you explore what your brand means, maybe one way to look at it is to ask a friend, in what word, what, does, what do I stand for? Is there something, is it hard work? Is it dedication? Is it a certain style, something that represents me? Am I accessible? Am I visible? Is it a matter of always being available to sign autographs? Can I make that connection? Am I human? Can people say, well, oh, he or she is just like me. I'm making that connection with them because I'm accessible. Am I relevant? When you start talking about who you are going to connect with, what brands, and Ishveen will talk about that in just a second, you know, does it make sense you know in a bigger broader scheme in the entertainment marketing does it really make sense if you had cardi b driving a minivan with a, a full of kids probably doesn't make sense with her brand and the product as hand do you stand out are you memorable can you cut through the clutter and you want to really understand your brand you might be sitting there thinking oh i guess i'm a brand but what what is distinct about me what is how what consistent image do I deliver? Well, my advice is ask some trusted friends. Be very clear. I am trying to monetize my success as a professional athlete. I want to better understand my brand so I can deliver it to a client and to ultimately their customer base. So ask your trusted friends. 
think about what's inside of you. What can you bring to the outside world? What are your touch points with the consumer? Whether that be through social media makes it so much more easier now than it did 15 years ago, but other touch points back in a non COVID world, as far as interacting with people, where you are, where you can be seen. You have a story. You may not have the most dramatic story. You were not necessarily uh, uh, a double amputee that somehow was able to win an Olympic medal, but that's okay. Everyone has a story and everyone has a great story. Figure out how to tell that story through your touch points, through how you communicate with the outside world and do it consistently. Don't change your brand every couple months. Don't, um, you know, suddenly have orange hair and then the next day be as clean cut as, um, as a guy I'm going to show you in just a second. So um, there's some different ways to understand your brand. And remember, it's all about how the customer perceives your brand. So here is a, uh, a personal brand example, right? This one's, a, these are the dramatic ones just to make a point. Steve Jobs with his brand, right? Classic mock black mock turtleneck jeans and sneakers all the time for 20 years this is how he appeared in public i don't know if this is how he dressed every day at apple maybe he was that dedicated to consistently delivering a band plenty of classic rock bands out there a lot of songs that you know but zz top is quite distinctive because when you think of zz top you think of the two lead guys with their long beards that is part that is ear cannot be separated from the ZZ Top brand. And one of the classic musicians, Elton John, always with a unique flamboyant style of glasses from his early days to uh, current times, it was always about unique glasses. He must have gone through tens of thousands of pairs of glasses. It would not be Elton John if he was wearing contact lenses here. So let me switch over to Ishveen, the CEO and founder of Open Sponsorship, who's going to take you through some of the highlights of, or some of the do's and don'ts and um, lessons to be learned about social media. Thanks, Rob. Um, awesome stuff. Enjoyed that a lot. Um, no worries. <laughs> Sorry about that. A little quick on that. Perfect. So we're going to focus today's session from my side. Obviously, there's a lot that you do to build your personal brand, right? Like appearances, community work, what you do on the field, of course, is a huge aspect. But a really topical um, aspect, which I know a lot, a lot of athletes really struggle with or thinking about is the social media, right, aspect. You, you were born into this world to be an athlete, you've practiced all your life and you're achieving amazing things on the field, hopefully. So why do you even think about social media? Well, you know, it's a fact of life today that your social media is almost like your digital avatar of who you are. It allows you to build connections with your followers. Um, it allows you to show off um, aspects of your life that may not be visible, just you know, on screen if you're competing or on the field. And honestly, it's very, very data driven. Um, and it's really easy, easily measurable to say, hey, this is the impact I have. So, you know, I might have 10,000 followers, but they're mostly made up of this demographic, this location, this age range, this ethnicity, and that's really powerful. So no longer is it just about, you know, how famous are you? It's more about, well, who, who follows you? Who is your fan base? Who's your, um, who do you influence? And the reason why that's really important is because there's so many different reasons why brands would want to partner with an athlete. Um, maybe it's because of your following. Maybe it's because of how big you are. Maybe it's because of how big your brand is or who your brand is. But it can also be, well, how much do you influence my customer? So, you know, we recently started working with a, a company, Bowerfind, who um, make medical equipment, sports equipment. and for them, working with athletes is because you are inevitably friends with lots of other athletes and athletes is their core customer. And so I think there's something really special about social media where it gives you a voice with your followers and your friends, but it also allows brands to leverage that vo voice in a, a very low touch way. So why social media? Because honestly, it's relevant and, it, and it's good for you. So let's go to the next slide. So let's talk a bit about like what is a good social media page look like? And I know it's something that we all struggle with. Should we 
you know, obviously politics is a huge topic. Should we be talking about these things that can be polarizing? Uh, do I filter all my pictures or do I leave them natural? Um, should I be in all of my pictures? What, what's a good product picture look like? Do I need to be in it or should it be a nice picture of, um, of something else? And there's not, it's not like there's a good and a bad and your vibe is your vibe. But there are a couple of things that we do see as helpful when it comes to having a good social media feed. So is your page all sponsored content? And of course, there are definitely athletes out there. Um, I think I was looking at Richard Sherman's page recently and nearly every single post that he puts up is a sponsored content. Um, and this was on Facebook and, and that's fine. And that's his prerogative. And obviously there's still a lot of value for brands working with him, um, even if he doesn't have a lot of organic content. But I imagine for most athletes, you do want to have like a heavy dose and a heavy mix because obviously your followers, you know, they want to hear from your sponsored brands, but they also want to hear, well, what's happening in your life generally? The best is obviously if your sponsored partnerships are so authentic to who you are. For example, let's say you recently had a baby and you work with a diaper brand. Um, that's super authentic. It's you're showing off the, the sponsored content, but also you're showing off an aspect of your life that's just kind of awesome. Same thing if you think about like um, health topics, like whether you're vegan or you know mental health or anything like that. So I'd say, is your page all sponsored content? It shouldn't be. Having said that, if a lot of your sponsored content is very authentic to who you are, then that's okay as well. Does your page reveal personal information or interests? We've really seen a big trend. Oh, sorry, Rob, could we get, yeah. Right. We've really seen um, a big trend with um, athletes being more vocal about who are they really? Like, I'm more than just an athlete and um, I have a life and this is who I'm married to and, and these are the kind of things I wanna do when I'm not uh, training or competing. And that's just really interesting. It's really interesting to brands, but it's also really interesting to your fan base, which inevitably means that your fan base grows. Um, a great example of this is we were recently working with Levi's and they're always looking for athletes who care about causes. They wanna know who cares about voting or who cares about discussing topics that are sometimes difficult to talk about. So if this is you, voice it, allow your social media feed to reflect that. Do you interact with your following? This is such a big tip from our side, what we see as a, a good brand ambassador. So when, let's say you put up a content piece for a supplement brand and you're like, hey, check out this new supplement I started taking, it's awesome. And then you'll get comments. Now, obviously some of those comments may be just, hey, good luck in the game, or you know, we love you, this photo looks great. But inevitably there'll be a couple of comments which say, hey, does it taste good, that supplement? Or does it really work? Or where did you buy it from? And if you comment back to at least a few of those comments, inevitably you are gonna help the brand to see conversions. You make your followers feel good. And when it comes to our job at Open Sponsorship to try and pitch you as a great athlete to partner with, it is so much easier. So that's an example on your sponsored post, but I, you know, one of our investors is NBA All-Star Baron Davis, and we see that he is often commenting back to his followers, even you know small guys who he doesn't know. And it's just, it's a great sign of, of a personable athlete. And then lastly, are your posts organic? So going back to that first bit, authenticity, we definitely, you can see when um, a post is organic to who you are, there's more effort. And again, it, you know, should I have a filter on my uh, picture? Well, that's, who, that's up to you. Should I do more video or imagery? That's up to you. Um, should I do reels and put funky music behind it? That's up to you, but just stay authentic because there's enough brands out there who want different types of athletes. So, we picked up one of our um, athlete examples, um, awesome, awesome um, Paralympian, a former Paralympian, Abby Duncan. And as you can see, not a huge amount of followers, um, but she does a great job and she gets a great a, a good number of deals through us. And it's because her pages, it's a heavy, it's a great mix of um, her sponsored content plus stuff about her. Her pictures, you know, they're not heavily filtered, but product is clear, it's who she is, it's her vibe, um, and 
even things like in the bio, you know, a little bit about who she is, like I'm Paralympian, I've been a gold medalist, now I'm a personal trainer, um, this is where I live. And so, you know, and underneath like the, the few different, I'm vegan, I like to travel, I'm into to ball, right? And so really clear page on who she is. A brand comes in and they're like, great, do I wanna work with Abby? I know exactly who she is. I look at her content, seems clean, I get her vibe. Yes, she doesn't have the biggest following, but hey, I still like her content and that's why I wanna work with her. And so I can't emphasize enough that it's not always about the biggest following, but it's all about like, who is, um, who are you on social? And is that the kind of thing a brand wants to um, partner with? And having said that, I'd also say, be realistic about your rates. When you first start out, maybe you're doing smaller deals and you build up your following and, and you get to those like you know, thousands of dollars of worth of deals. So how to build a personal brand. Um, is this my bit, Rob, or is this back to you? Uh, this, you can do this if you like. Cool. So perfect. So, I mean, Rob already touched upon it quite a bit. Who are you? Um, who are you beyond the core? I think we're in a really amazing time where you can, you're encouraged by your fan base to talk more about your life. Um, you know, back in the day, I think it was taboo for athletes even to talk about whether they drank. Now it's like, hey, do you drink wine? LeBron James is always drinking wine in his podcast. What do you guys do in your off time? You know, tell us about your family life. Tell us about what you struggle with. Um, tell us about tough days as well as the good days. So for you, you should sit down and say, well, what are the interests and passions that I have? Um, what am I comfortable sharing? And, you know, here, how do I want to be perceived? I would say, I would encourage you, be open, especially if you want to get sponsorship. Like brands love working with um, brand ambassadors who they can trust, they can rely on, who they understand. Um, how do I stand out? I mean, uh, I know we talked a little bit about image versus video. I would definitely say, I feel like video today is a 10 out of 10. If you are comfortable creating video, and I think the beauty of things like TikTok or Instagram Reels is, you don't even need to speak anymore. So if you don't enjoy the sound of your voice or your conscious, put something fun up of, of you playing or your home life and put it to a really fun video. Videos get engagement and they're also really engaging for your followers. Um, and then build and sustain that presence. I know it can be tough to regularly post on social media, but the way that a lot of these algorithms work, they favor um, influencers or athletes who post regularly. So try and keep it up, even if it's like a meme every now and again, or, or whatever it may be, repurpose, repurpose old content. Um, try and keep posting on social media because that activity level does really help you out. So let me uh, shift over. And we'll speak about just a few examples of some athletes as brands. Right, one example, let me see here. Peyton Manning, talking about clean cut. I brought up this slide to a group of my students, not pretty, uh, most recently. And I asked about Peyton Manning and they said, well, he's kind of like your dad. You know, he, he's always wearing a button down and he's kind of goofy. And you know, he's had that uh, keeping it tight haircut for a long time as well. Five time MVP, two time Super Bowl champion. And there he is in the lower left with his nice blue sweater and his checkered, his checkered button down. But his personality through the ads he chooses to do, and that's important to know, choosing to do, is with DirecTV, taking advantage of the fact that he was retired now. Now on Sundays, he's sitting on the couch watching football. And of course, the ever-present uh, commercials for Nationwide Insurance and Brad Paisley. Welcome to Peytonville. He certainly is very goofy. And the straight man, of course, is Brad Paisley. It's been a while since we've seen any ads with Peyton and, and Papa John's, but two football legends, Joe, Manta Joe Montana and Peyton Manning, uh, always playing off with Papa, right? He always called him Papa in those ads, if you remember. He chose carefully to build the Peyton Manning brand. You're not going to see him wearing a tux and slinking into a, um, into a Mercedes or a Lexus, but you're going to see Peyton with this consistent look like your dad. Derek Jeter. A 18-year uh, Hall of Famer, formal ceremony isn't happening this year, but he's certainly been elected into the Hall of Fame, communicating who he is, not just his glowing smile, but the word respect, and Nike certainly focused their ads around just Derek Jeter, 
no other word to describe him than someone who would be respected, who worked hard, who delivered, who was always positive, never controversial, never doing anything radical. The greater rate ad in the upper right, when it was later in his career, muscles are rebuilt and muscles are reborn. Then I use this example in the lower right, early in his career, he was on Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live, he was the host, and he dressed in drag. Somewhat, I think if he could turn back the clock now, and he was actually more strategic about the brand he was creating, he may not have done, he might have still hosted Saturday Night Live, but he may not have um, dressed in drag, but you, you know, it's also good, you can't be too serious all the time, you can poke fun of yourself. And then Paige Sparanek, I think I'm pronouncing her name correctly. She went to the University of Arizona, played on the ladies golf team there, made it to one pro event, but that was it. But she has built up a brand for herself strictly on social media. Certainly she's beautiful and she uh, has a certain style that she's always delivering. She's not playing golf in a traditional golf skirt and a, a button up. Uh, golf, golf shirt and golf skirt, excuse me, but she has produced her own set of, of short golf tips playing around with, with Paige. A little bit of a, a twist there, but then also communicating who she is here in the, in the dress in the lower right. Very elegant and shapely, of course, but when you read the post, she did some shopping spent some time on the beach. It wasn't all about golf, but showing her human side. And you see she has, a, she is strictly a social media generated brand with the ad of her hitting into the, um, into the screen in the upper right, nearly 2 million views for that particular image. So before I pass it on to Ishveen, I just want to tell you about something I'm doing if you're interested in learning more. I teach at Wharton. I've also repackaged my courses for corporate customers over the years. I've just created a sports marketing crash course. Very easy. Three Thursday evenings in December for 90 minutes at a time to go deeper into sports marketing, specifically media, marketing, sponsorship, and merchandising. So I have some information here. At the end of this, there'll be some information in our thank you, and you'll get a link to the recording of today, should you want to go back and review some things. But if you go to that URL on the bottom of this graphic, you'll be able to register for my class. Um, there is no homework, there are no assignments, you don't have to do a paper, but I guarantee if you're looking to learn a little bit more about your industry, the industry that you um, are committed to right now, but you never had the time to learn about the nuts and bolts and some of the strategies involved, this class will be worth your while. So let me move it over to Ishveen to speak a little bit more about how you can maximize the open sponsorship platform. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, perfect. So last bit of the session. Um, perfect. It, open sponsorship. So hopefully you all are on open sponsorship um, as an athlete or an agent or a PR manager um, using what we've built. So very quickly, the mission of our company is to make it really easy for sponsorship to happen. Um, we love sponsorship. Obviously for athletes, it's super important. It could be the financial backbone that keeps you in the game. For brands, it's a great way to be culturally relevant, um, to leverage the, um, you know, the, the power of sports in their own brand image. Um, and obviously with the rise of influencer marketing, we've seen a, a huge amount of money being put into social with influencers. And our job is to position our athletes as equally viable influencers for that spend. So why open sponsorship? Um, hopefully you've all seen it's super easy. It's free for athletes and agents to sign up. We charge a commission on any deal that gets done. We sell the brands for you. We're the ones who are going out there talking to these brands saying, hey, athletes are powerful. And you know, we try and hire ex-athletes. Um, I'm a former student athlete myself and, and I really believe in the, the power of the athlete and saying, you know, it's not just about the followers um, or their social footprint. Athletes are amazing ambassadors. They count for so much. They've done so much for society. Um, your kids look up to them, everything else. So you know, use athletes in your next branding campaign. Our goal is to really help you out. And obviously we're doing that through sponsorship because it's financial, but hopefully this webinar is a great example. We want you to understand sponsorship. We want you to come back and give us ideas on what we could be doing better uh, to bring you more 
more compensation and, and more deals. Um, and then little features that we have in our platform, you know, where we manage the payments, we understand security is a huge thing. You probably don't want to give out your bank details to a hundred companies, um, especially if you're doing smaller deals. We help to make sure that you get paid, that the money's sitting there, that if you do a deal, you're, you're not, you know, you're not going to get screwed over. Um, and then we understand that you don't always want to do a deal with just a sports brand. You probably have enough Nike gear in your uh, cupboards. What else can you do? And, and that's really, you, you know, hopefully the people who use us see, we go out to the CBD category, we go out to health and wellness, we go out to startups, um, makeup brands, if you're female, if you're male, then grooming products. We really try and find brands that you're going to be genuinely interested and excited to represent. So very quickly going through an OS profile. Um, so we picked up Shantai McMillan, has an awesome um, profile with us on open sponsorship. What makes a good profile? So you can see here a little bit about why should you sponsor me? Keep it short, lightweight, really just a little bit about who, who are you as a, an athlete? Um, you know, what's your sport? What's your interest? Why should you be interesting to brands? There's a section here for lifestyle and interests. Complete that, put in as much as you can. You know, obviously there's assets like, do you have pets? Do you have kids? Do you drink? Are you married? But then there's also these interests like, what are you into? Are you into uh, fishing or shopping or food or art? These kind of things um, really help out brands when they're thinking about using an athlete for more than just a sports campaign. Of course, connect your social media platforms as well. Um, we just recently added TikTok. We've got Snapchat in there. Um, connecting doesn't require your password. It just means to add in your link so that it's easy for brands to get to you from your platform into your, uh, from our site into your different social media platforms. Once you've set up your profile, you're going to be able to view all of the brand campaigns that are on open sponsorship and brands can also kind of ping you and, and send you proposals directly. But once you apply to a campaign, it's a bit like a job posting. You know, you want to put your best foot forward, include an interesting pitch. So we picked up an example from one of our star athletes, Bill O'Brien, he's done over a hundred deals um, with us at open sponsorship. And, you know, he makes them personable, um, fun to read. Once a brand sees this, they know that this is an athlete that is genuinely interested in their product, their campaign, and that the chances are, if they pick this athlete, he's gonna see it through and, and produce really good content as well. So take your time on the pitch. It doesn't need to be long, but just make it really authentic. What does great content look like? You know, we've already covered this, but here's another example from Bill where, you know, the product is visible. There's no question that this, this um, content is for this product. It's obvious what the product does. It's supposed to, you know, go into the, um, the dog's mouth. It's a, it's a pet food as opposed to anything else, but he's made it really relevant. The dog's in there, he's in there. It's great lighting. There's no other logos visible. So it all just absolutely looks great. And so, you know, this is a great example of a, a good post, not hard to capture, but just thoughtful. There you go. There it is. There you are. Um, pricing. I'm sure there are a lot of athletes who have struggled with, well, how much should I charge? And we try and make this easier for you. So we have algorithms to say, hey, based on your social media following, this is how much you should charge. But of course, it's up to you at the end of the day. Um, and so follow our guidelines. Remember, I think I mentioned earlier, you can go in low and build up over time. Um, you know, like anything, it's good to get a couple of good reviews under your belt. It's good to get a bit of, you know, deal making on, on, on your page and then up the price. So we always do encourage start low, follow our guidelines. But of course, it is ultimately up to you. Um, and then this is just a couple of like really fun deals that we've seen. You know, it's product is really visible. You can tell that you're an athlete, right? We don't want to... Um, remove the fact that you are a sports figure and you're active and that's your lifestyle. So make that come across, but make sure that the product is this first and foremost as well. And then, you know, in the, in the comments, you can see fun comments, tagging the, the brand up front. Don't include any other brands in a sponsored post. Um, it's just kind of poor form. Focus it on that. Follow the instructions that are given to you. It's, it's easy and fun. Okay. 
Let me uh, come back here. I'm back. I'm back, although I can't see myself. So I just wanted to remind you that if you're looking to learn a little bit more, here's the key information, my email address, my phone, should you want to text me, uh, not only to uh, sign up for this crash course, if there are additional questions you might want to ask um, or inquire about, uh, here's the information you need. Ashton, I believe we have a question. Yeah, so I can just quickly read out. We have two. Um, I'll take the last one first because it's very quick um, about us and then I'll, I'll leave you with the, the other one. And I know we have three minutes, so we'll keep it short. But please, if you've got any questions, do send them over. So, um, Atilia, you asked, do we work with non-US based athletes? Absolutely. We don't have as many brands. Um, not in the US, but we also have brands who do things kind of globally. So definitely get your yourself or your athlete signed up. Um, we definitely have a global footprint. And then Rob, I will leave this one over to you. Um, can you see the question from Joanne? Uh, Joanne about my daughter excels in two different sports, one yep. at a national level, but a less popular sport in terms of sponsorships and scholarships. Two shows a lot of promise in the much more popular sport. We're struggling if one sport should be picked and which one considering she wants sponsorships and scholarships. I wouldn't make that decision based on her, her upside. I understand the, um, I wouldn't make that decision based on the potential for her sponsorships. Certainly scholarship is a very important decision to get an education based on your athletic accomplishments. And that's a very important thing but she also has to be happy with what she's doing. She has to know she's going to succeed. And ultimately, she wants to make a decision that she doesn't regret and saying, oh, I should have taken the other one because I could have uh, been better at that. Certainly don't succeed first. Derek Jeter succeeded first. Peyton Manning succeeded first. They weren't managing their brands for commercial purposes. They were managing their athletic accomplishments first. Do that and everything will follow. Yeah, love that, love that answer. Um, another question, are you able to sign up as an agency and have the athletes you work with listed under the agency? Absolutely, I would say about 70% um, of our athletes are actually signed up by agents. Um, and, you know, mostly because a lot of athletes wanna focus only on their on field. Um, we love both, we absolutely love both and we kind of treat both the same. So agency can sign up and have many athletes under their account. And um, we're actually recently building the functionality um, that's been requested where can an athlete manage their account as well as an agent manager account. Um, so we'll be having that soon as well. Okay. So I think we're right on time. So Rob, thank you so much. Um, I have learned a lot and I really enjoyed um, kind of really understanding a lot of the things that you kind of see out there, like Peter Manning, who is he or Coke and how did they build that? But really getting into the weeds was, was amazing. Terrific. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Appreciate thank you. you coming. Yeah, sorry. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>